Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. <clears throat> Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done hundreds of them now, and if this is new to you and you'd like to see previous ones, please go to batgap.com and check the past interviews menu. This program is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers, so if you appreciate it and feel like supporting it in any amount, there are PayPal buttons on every page of the site. Um, my guest today is Dina Merriam, and when I first started preparing for this interview a week ago, I usually like week to week I completely focus on the person that I'm about to interview, and I don't even think about ones in coming weeks beyond that. I, and so I hadn't really thought much or tuned into Dina or anything. I just sort of turned my attention to her last Saturday after finishing the previous interview and I began poking around in her book, uh, My Journey Through Time. And my first impression was, oh, this will be fun. We're going to talk about reincarnation and, and I haven't really talked about that topic much on Batgap. But then as I read her bio and began reading her book, um, um, I guess my first impression was, wow, this is much about much more than reincarnation. I mean, she has vivid memories of a number of past lives and has kind of understood the connections between them and how they all kind of led into the life she has been living this time around, in which, now's, now's my chance to read her bio here, in which she has been working in the interface field for 20 years and founded the Global Peace, Peace Initiative of Women, GPIW, in 2002. Initially, the organization was designed to provide a global platform for women, women spiritual leaders, to organize and mediate dialogues in areas of conflict and tension. This soon expanded to include an equal number of men and women and men and women spiritual teachers and to deal with a range of issues including climate change, ecological destruction, racial inequality, etc. The premise for the gatherings organized by GPIW is that at the heart of all these issues is a spiritual crisis and the way to address them is a shift in consciousness. That's a point I've been bringing up in many interviews over the years. Dina has served on the boards of Harvard University Center for World Religions, the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy, Dharma Drum Mountain Buddhist Association, among others. In 2014, she was awarded the Nuwano Peace Prize over the year in Japan. Over the years, as memories of past births have arisen, Dina has recorded them in order to better understand the karmic patterns. She has now shared her memories in this book, My Journey Through Time, in the hope that others will gain insight into their own lives through this sharing. And I, I must say that I have. I mean, it's a very well-written book. She, she's a good writer and good speaker. I've, in addition to reading this whole book, I've listened to about five hours of her talks over the past week. And um, I really kind of felt like I learned a lot and benefited a lot from the various stories. It gave me insights into my own life and, you know, influences in it and challenges in it and stuff like that. So, you know, it's been a fun week preparing for this, and I really appreciate your being here, Dina. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Yeah. 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 And I'm, and I'm glad the book had the impact. I mean, you know, it, it, there was, um, I struggled a lot with whether to share this openly or not, because mm -hmm. they're very personal stories. And I, I, my hope is that, well, there were a number of, of um, hopes. One is that would help people overcome the fear of death. Yeah. And to, to and to know that that what they're doing, that they're in control of their own destiny, so to speak, that their past shaped the present and the present shapes the future. And through the whole process, I began to more consciously think about the future. Mm -hmm. what, what do we want to create for ourselves? I mean, we are the shapers of our life. Yeah. And that gives us a different responsibility than just, you know, we, reacting because most so much of our activities are reactive. You know, we're just reacting to what comes our way, which is mean, which means that we're working through karma from past actions. Mm -hmm. But but how do we take control of the process? That was really the 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 um, understanding I sought. Yeah, and I run into and have interviewed people um, who don't who are spiritual people, which is why I'm in, I've interviewed them, but who don't believe in reincarnation, don't think that that's the way the universe works, um, or who don't think that the law of karma is a real thing, that they think it's just some Hindu philosophy or something, that <clears throat> the universe doesn't work that way. Um, so you, I'm sure you have too. So I'm sure you don't try to 
badger people into believing anything, but you know, how do you converse with people who express those attitudes and yet have a spiritual uh, aspiration in life? You know, my, my, my sense is that, you know, the law of gravity worked before people <laughs> endorsed it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, it didn't just start working with Newton. It, right. it was always, a, the universe is based on law, physical law, spiritual or mental law, you know. And actions have reactions. To me, it's not much different from gravity. Actions have reactions. They're reactions. Everything brings about a, a, a reaction. Um, and what I what I, I understand, if people don't have memories, or uh, if they if they don't, I mean, I think everybody has clues, inclinations. But if if they're not present in the conscious mind, why should you believe? I think that we our beliefs are based on our experiences. So I never try to convince anybody. I say, if you haven't had these experiences, then, you know, I can understand why you wouldn't believe. Uh, but, but what I am struck by is how many more people accept this today. In America, I read a Pew Forum poll that 25% of American Christians accept uh, reincarnation. I'm sure it's, it's a lot more, actually. <laughs> these are just people who admit to that. And karma has become part of everyday parlance. They talk about it in the business world. People talk about karma as if it's just a, a, universal, uh, a universal truth, which it is. <laughs> so um, I think that, that, that as it's much easier to talk about the things in public. And it was interesting when I decided to go public with this book. And, you know, my family, my family doesn't know about a lot of my work. They know that Dean is off doing these conferences, but they don't really understand the spiritual work. And some friends of mine said, well, don't put your name to it. Put it <laughs> anonymous. Right. And, I, and I thought, you know, either I'm going to come out with it or not. Yeah. Um, but I think it's, things have changed. Ten years ago, it would have been harder to come out with a book like this sure. and not be looked at as being a little bit off in left field. Yeah. Yesterday we were in the grocery store and some lady was handing out lemonade samples. So I took a couple of lemonade samples and she said, well, it's only two for, you know, two dollars or whatever. And I said, oh, my wife wouldn't let me buy this. It has a lot of sugar in it. And, and she said, well, you know, you only live once. And I looked at her and said, are you sure about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, I try to reconcile, you know, because I work in the interface world and I, I work with people from, from um, the Abrahamic background as well. Um, I, 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 and I've had some conversations with them. And if you identify with your personality, if I'm totally identified with Dina, Dina's only coming around this once. Now, Dina will exist in my memory. And there are, there are aspects of Dina. What I try to understand, though, through this is what is it you take with you? And what is it do you shed? So, so... At the end of the day, the, one of the, 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 the impacts, and then I also judge spiritual experiences by the impact it's had on you. This to me was not a curiosity matter. It wasn't, oh, I'm so curious, who was I? It was, it was um, trying to understand the patterns that emerge, what my calling is in this life, how I got here and into this work, uh, and, pa and, and how, how karma works. Mm. Uh, and it changed my sense of identity. I mean, I identify with all the, I go back to seven or eight lives. I, I identify with all of those personalities and none of them. Yeah. I can't go back and say I'm the same person that I was in Africa or that I was in Japan. I'm different now because I've had a series of experiences. I'm not going to be the same person into the future that I am now because hopefully I would have grown and learned. But it's interesting to think, what are you going to take with you? I mean, I sum up a life in 40 pages, mm. the highlights. And what are those highlights? Very often, it's, it's the spiritual encounters that you've had. For me, the beauty of looking back is to see the spiritual guides and teachers in every life there was somebody. And to me, that was enormously comforting to know that if that was my past, hopefully that will be my future. There will always be a spiritual guide to appear at a critical moment. You know, sometimes it was to save me from drowning in the Ganga at one moment. <laughs> Another, it was in the jungles of Africa when this shaman woman appeared. Um, and so these are the things, these are the memories that you take with you. Yeah. Let's dwell for a moment more on the, the sort of comparison of believing or accepting or understanding that reincarnation is the way the universe works 
versus not thinking that. Um, and, you know, if we can, I mean, you and I have both been on the spiritual path for 50 years f under teachers who taught this, and so it's kind of ingrained in us. But many people don't and, and don't think that way. And, um, and it's like, I, I often wonder, like, what is their perspective? Like somebody like Anthony Bourdain, for instance, who, you know, c committed suicide recently. I suppose he thought that that was just going to sort of s snuff out his existence, lights out, you know, I'm out of here, and I will cease to exist. But obviously, if you have a reincarnation ex perspective, then you don't think that. And perhaps if he had had one, then it would have altered his choices. You know, he wouldn't have made that choice because he would have felt that, well, there might be consequences. I better kind of work it out in this life. Um, oh, go ahead and comment on that before I say anything more. Well, I, I think um, physics has shown that energy doesn't, uh, does, does, it doesn't disappear, it transforms. Mm. So consciousness doesn't snuff out. It moves into something else. So, so I, I can't even get into the mindset of thinking that consciousness just ends. Well, obviously or materialists, that, though, think that consciousness is an epiphenomenon of brain functioning, and they wouldn't think of it as some energy, which is, they would say, you know, when your body dies, that's the end of consciousness, and whatever energy is in, inherent in your, your physical makeup, sure, that'll be transmuted into other forms as it decomposes, but as far as any kind of soul or entity or some such thing that's going to carry forward, you're imagining it. Well, that's, it, it's, it's how you look at consciousness. I mean, scientists would say the mind creates consciousness where, where we would say consciousness creates the mind. Right. Consciousness, the mind, I mean, what, how can you create consciousness? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, um, what we've lost sight of in this rational uh, um, period is that everything is consciousness. Yeah. Trees, everything is a manifestation of consciousness. There's nothing that's not consciousness. So, um, so what, what I say, I mean, what I say in terms of my book, if you want to take it as a good read, as a novel, take it as that. But I think there's some lessons in there on, 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 on patterns mm -hmm. and relationships that may be useful. Um, to me, that's just a very, that's, that's not the proper reading of the book, obviously, because I think that, that science may be on the verge of discovering more about what this thing we call death. And one of the reasons I decided to go public with the book is that there is a new interest, a new interest in looking at death with new eyes, I would say. You know, you have, you have books now written about um, near-death experiences or, or death experiences, that surgeon, neuro, neuro, neurosurgeon to, who... Even Alexander. Mo who mocked it until he had an experience himself. Right. And, and, of course, the question is, how can you know an experience is true. Well, you can say that about anything. You can say that about a memory. I have a memory of, a, of being sexually abused as a child. Well, how do you know it's true? Mm -hmm. You were the only one there. Nobody saw it. Why should I believe you? Because it impacted who you were. It, imp psych it psychologically impacted you. Something happened that psychologically impacted you. When I looked at these memories, and I went and verified things that I had seen, I went to those places one was in Europe, one was in Russia, and found the streets that I had seen that matched up to what, what I had remembered. Um, but also I, I found things in myself that I had pushed aside that resonated. Um, there were so many things. In each life, there was something in myself that remained from that period. I mean, you know, starting with the previous birth that I talk about in, in Russia. One thing that struck me as I was reading your book, is the um, great degree of, of detail that you you remembered. I couldn't write that much detail about what I did yesterday, you know. And and here you are writing all this stuff about lives that you had hundreds of years ago, and right down to like detailed descriptions of circumstances you're in and conversations you had and all that. And you know, I don't mean to sound skeptical, but did you kind of? take a little creative license and embellish this just for the sake of in telling a, an interesting story? Or did you actually remember it in that much detail? I can't, I can't say how these memories came to me. You know, there is, um, there, there, there is the um, idea, I don't know, you must have heard about the Akashic Records, sure. right? Where, where every action, every thought is recorded. Mm -hmm. um, we, one might say in one subconscious 
um, all the past is recorded. There is there is a, a database of all that happens. And for some reason, I was able to access that. I would be meditating and go into this deeply interior state where, you know, if people had spoken to me, I, I, I wouldn't have been able to rouse myself. I was in another dimension almost. I was in another time period where I was actually watching a scene, like watching a movie, mm-hmm. hearing conversations, knowing that I was the, which actor I was. And, um, and, and I just had to, I just had to listen. And then, you know, I keep a pad and a paper by my meditation, uh, especially when I'm having a lot of these. I mean, it, it's an ongoing process. The book is not the end. I mean, it continues to happen. Yeah. Um, and and I I'm almost finished a second book now, which goes wow. back to an earlier time. But um, uh, I I would come out of it and then just write down what I had seen and heard. And then of course, as I was doing the editing, I would say, no, that's not quite the way. So, yeah, I mean, I was my my mind was imposed upon these conversations. You know, I was put, putting my my writing ability to try to make it all um, into into to make sense. Mm-hmm. But but I have to say that I stuck as as closely as I could to the content that I was that I was uh, absorbing nice so why do you f- I mean as we know most people don't remember their past lives there are some fairly common stories of little children remembering things like uh, I saw some kid recently on TV that had detailed memories of his life as a World War II fighter pilot, and he knew the name of the plane, and he knew the names of his friends back then, and all that stuff. And you know, they they were able to corroborate all that. But most of us don't remember past lives. Uh, so, question number one: Why do you feel that is? Why are they blot? Why are those memories blotted out? And question number two is: How come you remembered them, where the, hardly anybody else does, especially uh, later in life? Well, I think that there's a good reason why uh, these memories are submerged. I think it would be very hard, uh, and I had a very hard time. The first, my first experience with this, which was the life just previous, which those memories came back to me maybe over a period of a year, many months. Um, I was, you know, single mom raising two teenage kids, holding onto a job, commuting to the city to work at a job as a writer. Um, and um, I, I had been a long a meditator since I was the age of 20, and a very serious meditator, not just a, you know doing 30 minutes here and there. Very very serious meditator. And experiences happen in meditation. I mean, one just doesn't just sit there. And and everybody has different experiences. I know people have talked to me about seeing the third eye and going into the light, and people seeing all kinds of things that never happened to me, you know. And one of the reasons we're not supposed to share our meditation experiences. And so that people don't get envious and say, well, you know, why haven't I seen that beautiful thing that you're talking about? So th- this, is, this is what happened to me through my, my meditative experiences. The door is just opened. Um, but the first time around, it was very, very difficult, very difficult. As when you read the book, you see that there were some very traumatic things that happened into that, in that life. I was in Russia during the Russian Revolution, sent out on a train, never saw my parents again was stuck in Europe waiting for them in a foreign land. And then World War II happened, caught not into Germany, wanting to escape, you know, get out of there so badly. And then I meet my guru, which to me was the highlight of that life. Um, and But here I am trying to hold down a job and raise kids, and I'm finding myself trapped in Nazi Germany, <laughs> reliving again and again, you know, being caught by the Nazis and all of that. Um, and then, of course, I died at, at, in Europe before I could get out. So I was going back. I mean, I'd be in meetings, you know, at, at work and be be crying internally over being sent out of Russia and, and at 14 and not seeing my mother and never seeing my mother again. So it, it awakens. It's not just a, um, you know, uh, uh, you're deeply engaged in the emotions that are, are awakened. So it's not just observing and saying, oh, well, that's interesting. It's like, you become that person again. I became that person again. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I went through all the emotional turmoil of that life. You know, whatever many years I had in that life, and I think I died young, maybe 40-something, mm-hmm. um, was squeezed into, you know, nine, ten months. Mm. And I went through the upheaval. 
And there were times when I thought I was losing it. I said to myself, you know, could I be, you know, hallucinating? And then I would say to myself, you know, I'm very grounded. I'm you know, running a household. I'm working at a job, a good job. Um, I'm a, a serious meditator. I'm doing my practices. I'm not imbalanced. And so I can see why people could get imbalanced by these experiences, especially if you don't know what you're going to awaken. You know, I, I caution people and they say, well, I want to go find out. It's not a, it's not a curiosity. I mean, I think that the reason it came to me maybe was so that I could share it. Yeah. And help um, um, validate the fact that that we are all eternal beings, that we've had a past and we've got a future. And maybe if we learn how our past affected our present, we could more consciously direct or shape our future. So I, that's why I decided to share it. I said, well, these, these experiences came to me, you know, not just for me to hold to myself, but maybe others would get. And actually, I shared the manuscript with a colleague, a writer friend of mine at work, who was an agnostic. I trusted her judgment very, very much. And she had just been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And she said, I know you're working on something. Could I read it? And she was so moved by this, and it helped her so much at the end of her life, that she said to me, Dina, you've got to publish this. Mm. You, you know, there are other people like me, because she didn't know what she was facing. You know, she was facing death. Pancreatic cancer is, yeah. you know... And, and she didn't know what, what, what she'd be facing. And it just gave her a lot of comfort. Is It's not the end. Yeah. That's a good point. Worth retouching on that. Um, you know, if we think that death is the end, and yet it isn't, then I think there's some deep discordancy or something between what we think and what actually is real. And that must uh, cause great fear. You know, because it, it must viscerally, intuitively feel wrong that I would come to an, a complete end, uh, because on some deep level we know we don't, and yet you know we and yet here we are dying, thinking that we're going to, and the culture has told us we're going to, and all. So it really must, kind of settling into the understanding that life is a continuum must somehow provide some deep solace or relaxation to the to our psyche, to our soul, I should think. But well, well, think about this. Our country is in the grips of fear right now. Right. Uh, and, and not, I mean, it's, it's the world too. I mean, many, many uh, governments are holding people through fear. Mm -hmm. Fear of the other, fear of this, fear of that. Uh, people have a lot of fear in their life. And the primal fear is the fear of death. Mm. You know, wh why are people so attached to their guns? They got to defend themselves so they don't get killed, so they right. don't die, you know? So instead of dealing with the more superficial fears, Let's get to the core fear, which is the fear of death. Mm. And, and, and the religions have been partially uh, responsible for creating this fear because uh, it's, it's this concept of punishment. Somebody's watching you and you're going to be punished if you don't follow the rules. It's not in, even <laughs> if, you're, if you lead a, 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 an ideal life. It's if you don't follow the rules. Mm. You don't follow the rules, you're going to be punished. And your death is going to be, you know, bad. So, so when you realize <clears throat> that nobody's judging you, you're shaping your own life future in order to learn and awaken. It's all about awakening. So your past shaped the conditions w which gave you the opportunities that you now have. And it's up to you whether you're going to use them for growth or not. And you, by what you do, are creating your future. That changes the whole equation. And, and, and people free themselves from a lot of these holds on them that religions and institutions have. People are controlled through fear. Yeah. And I think if we look deeply into, enough into probably every religion, we would find that they weren't originally intended to produce that kind of fear or produce those kinds of misunderstandings. You know, there, I've seen I mean, Yogananda himself uh, argues that Christianity once taught reincarnation, that it was edited out at the Council of Nicaea or something. So, um, you know, but things, right. things get distorted over the, over the long lapse of time. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in um, the Hasidics, they also talk about it. It, um, it, it. Things get distorted when power, when if power is accumulated by an institution. Mm. Suddenly, you, your main priority is maintaining that base, maintaining your, your institution, rather than liberating people, yeah. giving them the tools to free themselves. 
Well, organizations tend to be taken over by administrative types, and administrative types tend not to be mystics. So. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 It's main, maintaining the status quo or growing their, uh, their wealth and uh, following. Yeah. Um, so, yes, you were, uh, you were speaking of Yogananda. He was your guru. And, um, He's my guru. And you, of course, didn't discover him in this life until after he had passed away. Um, but then you recount your life, the one you were just mentioning where you were in Nazi Germany. I found it interesting that he had actually stopped through Germany on his way from the U.S. back to India in 1935, I think you said, and that he had actually tried to um, arrange... Um, a meeting, meeting with, with Hitler, Hitler um, yeah. hopefully to change Hitler's you know, way of thinking, and that, that didn't happen. But I found that to be an interesting little tidbit in your book. Yeah. Um, you know, I had felt, because of my, my, <clears throat> my yearning for, my, for Yogananda was so intense when I was 20, when I first met him, and at that time, a lot of my friends were coming back from India, and they had found their guru, or they were going to India, and, you know, they were there were teachers coming here, and they said, well, Yogananda's not here, you know, go, go to this one, go to that one. And, and I did try going to a few, but it, it didn't help. I mean, my guru was my guru, and I loved him, and I loved him with such depth that, that I was in tremendous pain that I, that I um, couldn't meet him in person. Yeah. And that went on for years, and then when I had the memory of having met him, it was like, oh, yeah, okay. That bond, that link in the body was made. Mm. I'm just reading the last chapter of your book, and, and I may not quite have grasped what you're saying here, but were you saying that um, this Swami that you met in one of your Indian lives and perhaps some guiding light that you had met in other lives was actually Yogananda in his previous lives, or, or were, were you not saying that? No, I didn't say that. And, and, and I, I mean, there's so many unanswered questions that I have. Mm -hmm. um, there were people who showed up, like that Swami, um, who I... I, I thought he might have been my um, my Sufi father, mm -hmm. actually, because he had such a fatherly uh, attitude toward me. Um, I, I, you know, it's like there's so, there. Each time I saw a life, remember, more questions came, which is why I say this is an ongoing journey. It's it's I, I'm trying to go back further in time uh, because you know we're we're. Um, so I put some of the pieces together in the puzzle, but the puzzle's still, you know, only half done. Yeah. Le maybe less than that. You know, we're at a we're at a very uh, interesting moment in time now, where where we're shifting from one era to another era. Um, the most people say into a higher era. Mm -hmm. um, and and so what what would a we so we we're, the the challenge that we face now is what how do you how do you live in that higher era what would be the what would life look like what would our society look like so i'm trying to go back in time to a higher era you know i only go back a few hundred years that's mm. not very far in time you have to go back thousands of years to get to a higher era when society was really at a, a completely different structure in a very different way um, and i think that that's important now for us to regain the memories of what a higher what would a higher civilization what did a higher civilization look like. There was a higher civilization. Again, this is a challenge to the Western model, which is linear. You come out of a primitive time, moving time, and that's not the way the Eastern world sees it. It's cyclical. Right. Yeah, we have the Yugas, and there were Yugas, much right. more glorious times than this, and, and so on. Yeah. And, and the time span is so long that it wouldn't necessarily be expected that archaeological evidence would, would turn yeah. up of these right. ancient times, because they're millions right. of years ago. Um, yeah, on this note, you said in your book, um, declines are said to be times of ascent. That was one sentence I plucked out of it. And, you know, it, to, from my perspective, it seems that our culture, our country, and our society seem to be declining. Some would argue the opposite. Um, but if you agree, um, what signs of ascent do you see amidst the decline? Well, I, I wouldn't call it a decline. What I would say is that the institutions of a dark, of a, of a less enlightened time are breaking down. Mm -hmm. So the economic, political, social institutions that have kept us in place or that have governed us for the last few hundred years are not working anymore. Right. So 
something else needs to emerge. What I would say is the, the signs of, 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 of a, uh, ascent are, is the awakening consciousness, not just more people. The fact that we can have the, this kind of conversation in a public way um, is an indication, but also the fact that there's much more unity among a certain subset of the religious traditions. You know, when I started working in the interfaith world 20 years ago, the key word word was tolerance. People don't use that word anymore. Tolerance, right. you know, where they talk about unity. Yeah, tolerance and, sounds like okay. I'm going to hold my nose and you know. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll get close to you, but you know, because I have to. <laughs> so so um, so we're, so there, you know, those who've been working in this field, Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, there's a much greater appreciation of the other and less judging, and that wasn't true. 50 years ago. Yeah. So 50 years ago, there was the assumption that, well, my way is the only way, and, uh, you know, I'll just sort of be chummy with this, these heathens here, these, you know, uh, but they, they're deluded and I've got the truth, right? And, and, and even though there are people who believe that, yeah. I believe there, it's, a, it's a receding tide. Yeah. One thing that I think about when I think about the whole interfaith thing is that, you know, what it really needs is for the the representatives of the various faiths to go beyond faith to direct experience. Exactly. Um, and if you're just stuck on the level of faith, then you're never really going to merge at a very deep level. It's like people who haven't sort of experientially the fa fathomed the depth of their own religion and arguing with similar people of other religions is like it's like people who haven't eaten in in a particular restaurant arguing over you know, which one serves the best food. None of them have eaten in, in, their, in their favorite restaurants, but they are arguing that they're, they're the best, even though they haven't tasted the food. You know? I, I mean, absolutely. And I think that's where the, the change is. Those, those, you know, there have been many, many initiatives of, 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 of monastics, of Buddhist and Christian monastics, coming together in complete sharing and unity, mm. Hindu monastics and Christian monastics. It's a subset. I mean, this, this is not necessarily the general population, but even among the general population, the fact that 25% of Christians, American Christians, would accept reincarnation or believe that's the way the universe works, that's a large number of people. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And doesn't the Pope these days say that, you know, you can sort of achieve salvation through other religious paths and so on? He, he's, he said a, a lot of things that he's had to then quite like he said there was no such place as hell. Uh -huh. But, you know, then he, and then he had a wrist slapped or something. <laughs> where, I mean, how can you keep people in fear, control them by fear if there's no, you know, place as hell, you know? Yeah. I mean, Yogananda was once asked about that and he said, where do you think you are now? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes when I think about religious fanaticism, you know, the my way, my religion is the only good one or the only real one and so on. I, I, if I talk to such a person, which I rarely do, I, I start bringing up astronomy, you know, because there are like 40 to 60 billion Earth-like planets in our galaxy and two trillion galaxies in the known universe and possibly unlimited universes. And yet, so it's, when you start thinking of it that way, it seems pretty absurd to think that one particular religion on one particular little teeny tiny speck of dust is the only one and, and that God has somehow, be, you know, consigned all the other ones to eternal darkness or something. I mean, when we, I mean, I think that there are scientific um, breakthroughs that could happen in the next hundred years mm -hmm. that could really have an impact on, on human consciousness. Like what? Like, like discovering advanced civilizations elsewhere in the galaxy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Could happen, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think somewhere in your book you talk about like phase transition. I don't know if you use that, or maybe it was in the talks I heard you give, um, but the fact that there could be quite a sudden shift that we don't see coming, you know, but all of a sudden it's upon us. Well, you know, the hundredth monkey, right. it doesn't need, you don't need all the monkeys. You just need a certain percent of monkeys, and it's not a big percent. It's like... Yeah you know, 1% or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, which is why I think that, that this, the spiritual work, I mean, people, a lot of people I talk to in the spiritual world are discouraged right now, because it's, you know, why, we seem to be, well, we're taking steps backward now, you take a step forward, now a step backward, and, and my sense is we can't allow that f feeling to overcome us, hmm. because more and more people are embracing this human unity and spiritual unity, uh, and, of course, there's going to be a reaction to that. There, there's going to be fear. People are fearful 
of losing their identities, losing what was familiar to them, losing the life that they knew. What are the implications for the future? And so this fear factor is going to try to pull things backward. But you can't. You can't slow down evolution. I mean, you can't reverse evolution. It, it doesn't work. You know, the universe doesn't work like that. Things move forward, but they move forward at a certain pace. Yeah. I was just reading, I don't know if it was your book or something else, about the how patience is such a virtue. You know, it's like God has his own timetable and, and you know, we we tend to be impatient, but if you if you can kind of put yourself in the mindset of the divine and, and how patiently it has unfolded this 13.72 billion year old universe, um, you know, I mean, not to say that we should be complacent and let let bad situations just fester, but it does give you a, uh, it cultures more patience to sort of take the big picture if you can. Well, I think we have to think in longer terms, you yeah. know, I mean, two, 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 I see two major human problems is this short term thinking, you know, we're, we're conditioned to think in terms of the next election cycle, right. and the next quarterly report in terms of the business world, yeah. you know, the next financial, you know, whatever. And, and that completely distorts uh, our understanding of things. And the other shift, I think, is for people to understand the law of cause and effect. Yeah. You know, I think it's very important for us to understand that what, that what we do individually and as a collective so I talk a lot in my book about the, how this works, operates at the individual level. Mm -hmm. But a lot of my thinking recently has been how it operates as a collective. Mm. You know, what we're experiencing as a collective now is a result of actions that have been taken in our name as a collective. Let's talk about that. Um, in fact, I have one of my notes here is collective inner spiritual shift, a prerequisite to societal change. So what is your thinking about the collective well, you know, I, I think that um, as a country, we've done a lot of things that have been undercover in the world. Sure. Well, for example, I took a delegation of religious leaders two years ago to Iran mm -hmm. for meetings in Iran. And, you know, I know that UK and US took out their democratically elected government mm -hmm. in the 50s and put in the Shah. Yeah. This was a man who was democratically elected, but he wanted to nationalize the oil fields, and the U.S. and the and the um, uh, Great Britain were not going to let that happen. Yeah. So, is there no impact on that? I mean, do we think that we can just do that and not reap the results of that? There's not going to be any payback to that. Yeah. We well, look how we messed. Look how we messed in Central America. We've yeah. messed majorly in Central America. So now, what's happening? We, such a scene of violence down there that they're fleeing to get into our country. Do we bear no responsibility? And, uh, and, and in the public space, nobody's talking about, hey, let's look at our actions and look what we've, sow what you, you reap what you sow. I mean, that's even in the, in the Abrahamic traditions. You reap what you sow. Nobody's looking at why we're, we've had, now we've, we've had a coup, so to speak. Our election has been ca hacked. So what we've done to other countries is, has now been done to us. Yeah. But are we going to change our behavior? Are we going to say we're not going to do that anymore? Hmm. They're already talking about regime change in any Iran again. It's like, if you don't learn your lesson once, twice, you're going to keep it, we, we're experiencing it again and again until you finally learn correct behavior. Yeah, interesting. Good uh, homework assignment for those who want to read more about the kind of things Dina was just saying is Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States quite an eye-opener in terms of all oh, this I stuff. I should read that. Yeah. yeah. We need to know that as Americans to understand and to get out of the situation we're in. We need to understand deeds that have been done in our name. Yeah. That's interesting. And I suppose, you know, for us to understand that as a culture, it's something that we need to learn individually. Um, I know that, you know, reading your book reminds me of something that is one of my operating principles, which is this long-term vision and I can't, in good conscience, um, go for some kind of short-term gratification, which I know will have long-term implications that are injurious to people, you know? Um, right. 
Right. And, but if you didn't have that long-term perspective, you might think, oh my God, I've only got 20 years left to live. I've got to make these radical changes in my life, you know, and regardless of the consequences or who it might hurt. You know, if, if um, well, I mean, that, that's the big shift that happens when you, when you, when you take, when you realize that the law of cause and effect is operational and that you have control to some degree. I mean, you have control of a lot. You can't change your past deeds. You can change whether you learn from them or not, whether you learn from your current situation or not. And then you can h help shape your future. Um, so, it, you know, but, but this takes deep reflection. It's not something that comes easily or automatically. Uh, and I think, I think that the reason of that is that we're, we're meant to reflect deeply on, on our actions in our lives and to um, begin to live more consciously. Yeah. You said a few minutes ago that a lot of spiritual friends are kind of feeling discouraged. Um, and somehow or other what you just said reminded me of that because w there's, we're so bombarded all the time with trivial short-term distractions, you know, and it's not really conducive to deep reflection. What, what, what hits us through the TV all the time and everything. And um, I, personally, I think that, you know, I've, it's nice to structure one's life around having time to meditate and reflect deeply and, you know, contemplate all these topics and, and points. And certainly one has a choice to do that. But, um, you know, a lot of people might feel they don't have the choice because they can, you know, they're working two jobs, they can barely make ends meet. and you know, they're just overwhelmed and bombarded. So that's a bit of a long statement. But um, why do you feel that your spirit, a lot of your spiritual friends are being discouraged? You know, I see two movements. I see a lot of people, uh, it's, it's, there's too much intensity and negativity, so they just want to, sh they want to, they want to shut it out. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are, you know, getting off social media, not even looking at the news. And I understand doing that to a partial degree, mm -hmm. but you can't create a bubble around yourself. I don't think that, I think the spiritual energy is needed in the streets right now. Yeah. So, um, I meant that figuratively, you know, not, not, not literally, <laughs> but yeah, sometimes um, literally, <laughs> sometimes literally, but yeah, but yeah. I, I, I'm like a social Earth Day activist. And those big marches and things like that. Those are good. Yeah, those are good. The March for Your Life. I mean, I think we have to show up now. I think mm -hmm. um, now is the time for those who've been doing spiritual practice for a long time to 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 really um, work to um, mobilizing that energy to to try to bring ethics back into the public space a sense of of virtue a sense of right and wrong a sense of how to behave mm. i mean we've lost it as a society i mean just you just every day you see the news yeah you know i mean you look what happened the congress is there yelling at each other screaming at each other they hate each other you know <laughs> You know, Trump is out there uh, demeaning people, yeah, and, and yeah. you know, and, and so you say to yourself, "Okay, if we comp the compass is going crazy. There's no moral <laughs> compass anymore. No sense yeah. of 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 uh, right action." And so, um, you know, those of us who 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 try to base our life on dharma, on a sense of, you know, uh, and living in accordance with some universal laws. Um, need to need to know what's going on we we can't live in a bubble <laughs> yeah except for retreat times there's retreat time maybe weekends or whatever sure to, to renew ourselves i just want to interject that those listening to the live broadcast feel free to send in a question if you like um or comment or and it could even be a skeptical question like why i don't believe in reincarnation or something we, we can handle it and um, to do that you would go to the upcoming interviews page on batgap.com and then down the bottom of it there is a form through which you can submit questions. Yeah, as you were saying that I was thinking, uh, you know, well Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King didn't live in a bubble. I mean they, they were sp spiritual dudes but you know they, they carried their spirituality into the streets so to speak and uh, you know and affected huge change in a nonviolent way. Uh, so they're, they're kind of uh, inspiring examples. So, so we do a lot of work with young people, and mm -hmm. and I'm always asking them, what is the future they want to they want to create? What 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 is the vision? What kind of society? What would the society look like? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, I mean, our uh, economic system is is not working. Um, it's it's 
getting more, the extremes are getting more, are greater and greater. Um, the 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 um, uh, social divisions are are greater than the, than they or maybe they always were bad, but now it's just more upfront how how polarized people are. So you you know what what how do we bring it all together? How do we come up with a new framework? And transition is always difficult. There's a, there's um somebody's using the the phrase you know we're between stories. The old stories mm. is is breaking down. The new story hasn't yet arisen. So this is the story between stories. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, and and so I think it is a in a way a confusing time, uh, but it's not like we're we're going down the rabbit hole. We're we're just trying to trying to create something new and it's not yet clear how to do that what that would look like yeah but i guess that stands to reason if we can step back a bit and you know what you were saying half an hour ago is that the old systems aren't working there are all these institutions of government and business and things that impact people's lives and impact the environment and so on that you know couldn't possibly exist in a more enlightened world and that you know will be their own destruction because if they continue on the way we're going there won't be a world in which for them to exist right (laughs) right and uh and so um, perhaps the reason your spiritual friends get discouraged is they look at that stuff and it seems so entrenched and so powerful and what can little old us do to to change it you know when there's so much money and power behind it um but you know i'm i'm kind of reminded of the little sprout that pushes its way up through the asphalt you know that has has the strength to do that i i think there's something more powerful in the subtle and what we're talking about here is something very subtle and therefore much more foundational much more sort of causal and that uh if we kind of keep sticking to that and working with that um it's bound to have um a major impact and perhaps even eventually become the predominant paradigm. That's what I believe. Yeah. You know, I think I think that um, things, um, this is hard to express, but things take formation in the spiritual world before they manifest physically. Uh huh. Yeah, it's good. They, 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 they the, the ideas come together and it takes a while b- before the inner begins to manifest on the external plane. Uh huh. And so I think we're at the visioning stage right now of, of what a new formation would look like. And it could take 100 years. I mean, what you said before about looking, in, looking at longer time periods. Um, you know, World War II went on for how many years? Ten years? Not even that long. Well, yeah, the Americans weren't involved that long, but it started in Germany earlier, yeah. Yeah, so, so that must, that's a long time to be at, at war, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so that made, a, you know, living in the middle of that, it could have looked like, you know, things could have ended. And, and uh, if you have, that's where patience comes in. If you, and, and the work that we do to build, uh, um, to build awareness, so much, that to me is the main work right now, is the shift in consciousness and building awareness. And I see, you know, since I've been doing um, radio shows around the book, I see that in all parts of the country, there are spiritual communities. There are mm-hmm. Dharma centers, there are yoga centers, there are spiritual radio shows, there, there are a lot of work being done on the divine feminine. I mean, there, there are communities around the country. It's not just, you know, in, in the major pockets. And around the world. And around the world, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and compare that with, like, you know, 1950s or mid-1960s or something, when, what was there? There was, there was Yogananda, <laughs> you know, doing his That's thing it. way back yeah. then. And then in the late 60s, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi came in yeah. and a few other things. Uh, but, you know, compare that to today and it's, yeah. it's be, I mean, it was weird to talk about meditation back then. Now it's kind of like they're teaching it in the boardrooms and so on. And, you know, when I, I became a vegetarian in 1970 or 70, and when I would go to restaurants, they'd think I had, I was ill. And they would just give me <laughs> some stream beans and potatoes and, and carrots and that. I mean, you look at now how how common it is, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I think that's a good example of what you just said, which is the, the subtle stuff takes a while to percolate up and become manifest. And, yeah. you know, we we were both, part- and many of those listening probably were, were participants in the 
sort of four or five decades ago as, when this subtle stuff was just beginning to get enlivened and a lot of it has become a manifest but there's a lot more to go but there's di yes, there's a difference though because at that time it was really bringing the spiritual ideas into the into the uh, into the west into the public place right. where we could talk about you know religious unity and truth you know all religions being a path to truth um, now I think there's a greater focus on on, on the institutions, you know, the economic system. No, it's not a dharmic economic system. This is not right. Yeah. You know, you know, ex excluding people. I mean, and maybe, you know, the, the whole Trump phenomenon of bringing this out into the open, maybe it's like bringing all the dirt up, the, the, you know, bringing the mud to the surface, uh, all the prejudices that people have that they didn't talk about before. I mean, that's how I look at it. I say to myself, where did all this stuff come from? We were not aware as a society that that there was this this um, polarization and anger and hatred, anger. Yeah, I saw a thing on the news yesterday where some woman was setting up a picnic table at a park or something like that, and she had a Puerto Rico T-shirt on, and some yeah. guy started screaming at her. You know, you shouldn't be in the country, and you know, you shouldn't be wearing that T-shirt and and things like that. And are you a citizen? You know, obviously he didn't even know that Puerto Rico was part of the United States. Right, <laughs> right. I mean. Where and he, end, he ended from? up facing two <laughs> felony charges for behaving that way. But yeah. so a lot of this kind of crap is is coming to the surface and perhaps getting uh, exposed for what it is. You know, it's like when you have a boil. Yeah. You know, the the pus has to come out. You know. Yeah. And so maybe this is just a cleansing process. I, I mean, it may it may have to get worse before it gets better. I don't know. You know. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that that those of us who have been um, involved in this movement for h greater human unity and to build a compassionate society, we really have to step out now and and um, and and try to mobilize our spiritual energies. Yeah, good. We could probably rant and rave on that point a little longer. But a question came in from Dan in London who asks: uh, Are there any special meditation techniques for exploring past lives, or does it more need to be one's predisposition to experience this? Well, you know, I'm, I'm often asked the question about past life regression because that is um, a technique that people use, and I have mixed feelings about that. I mean, in meditation, I think if one just introspects, you can see things, especially if you look at your earlier life, see strong interests in your earlier life. There are clues along the way. Uh, but if, if details are needed to be known, um, there are people who go to past life regression, and I have mixed feelings about that because you undergo hypnosis. Mm -hmm. And when you undergo hypnosis, you have to be very careful about who, who's hypnotizing you, and mm -hmm. you have to make sure that the person is trustworthy um, and credible. Uh, um, but I know people who have been helped by that if they've had a, like a phobia uh, that they couldn't overcome, and they've gone to past life regression. They've discovered where in the past this comes from. They've been able to overcome it. But I don't recommend it just for curiosity. Yeah. Yeah, Mar Marci always used to say the past is a lesser developed state and don't worry about your past lives and all that stuff. And, yeah. Um, I think the important thing is just to know that you've been around. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, yeah you've had experiences and you've ex most likely experienced. I mean, I say that my experiences are everyone's experience. We've all been rich and poor and this, you know, born in this skin and that skin. We've had a diversity of experiences. And and so we've we've been around a long time. So so um, we should be able to relate to that to the fact that we've had all these different experiences. You know, I mean, I, I had um, I can share some of some yeah, of sure. the ways. Please. Um, in in one of my chapters, I talk about a life in Africa, where um, I it would lived in a village, and at, at a certain moment, the village was uh, um, tr slave traders came in and raided the village. I was killed. But my younger sister was kidnapped, and, and as was my son, and taken across on the ship. And my sister uh, was thrown overboard. They had to get rid of some of the slaves, and so she died in the sea. Um, that was a few hundred years ago. Uh, about two years ago, we were in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, doing a dialogue on racial healing. And there was a young man there who was the uh, head of the Black Lives Matter in, in Charleston. And he said to us... Um, Tomorrow, we're doing a ceremony for all of those uh, uh, Africans who didn't make it over, who died in the journey, mm. and you are invited. We were half, 
half white, half black, this group, this dialogue. And so I said, I want to go. You know, this life I had remembered, but I wasn't, it wasn't uppermost in my mind. But as we arrived at the seashore and everyone was throwing flowers into the, into the water, and I started the ceremony throwing flowers, the image of my sister came up. And I, I remembered that moment and I thought to myself, I never was able to bring closure to the fact I had died. From, from the spirit world, I saw that she was being thrown over. Uh, but I never I was able to really bring that closure. At this moment, I was able to bring that to closure and I was able to, to do the, the ceremonies for her. And one of the white, young white men who was with us, part of our discussion, he felt very uncomfortable. And he said, you know, that was a private thing. We should not have been there. That was not for us. We were intruding on their space. <clears throat> and I turned to him, of course, you know, it's, I'm limited by what I can say <laughs> in public. But I didn't say, no, I, that was my sister who, I was, who died in the ocean. But I said to him, that was very, very meaningful for me. And I'm glad we were invited to, to join in. And, and that was a way of, of, of us bonding with the, what the community was doing. It was a very powerful moment for me. And it was it was it shows how the past comes into our present, even if we're not conscious. Now, if I had not remembered that life, I would have felt moved by the ceremony, but it wouldn't have been so personal. Yeah, it just would have been a moving thing to be part of that, all of that community. And we were just a few of us from the white community. There were mostly African Americans from the Charleston area who were ever doing their annual ceremony, playing the drums and throwing the flowers in. Um, but the difference is, is that this young white man felt uncomfortable and felt that, that this was an intrusion where I, having remembered my past, saw it as a, in a very personal light. Now, I've had a number of things like that happen. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, and so to answer the question, what can be done, I'd say if there's something compelling that you really need to, to find an answer to, um, you can find a guide to help you through this process of, of past life regression. But it's not necessary. Yeah. <clears throat> Patanjali in the Yoga Sutras talks about remembering past lives as one of the cities, and I think he prescribes some sutra or something that can help you achieve it if you really want to. But um, one thing I've noticed in talking to so many people is that a lot of people who have had profound uh, spiritual awakenings um, have spontaneously remembered past lives. Um, not in as much detail as you have, or at least they haven't written books about it, but um, you know, a lot of them have had clear recollections, which have kind of come spontaneously, unbidden, unsought, um, just as when something opened, you know, to a certain degree. And uh, I, I imagine they processed it and thought about it and felt through it and then moved on. But it, it may be something that could be commonly experienced uh, as people reach a certain stage of their evolution. I, I think it is is not uncommon to have um, to have glimpses, you know, to know, say, you know, my past birth was in China. I was a monk in China. I mean, I think I know people who tell me this, mm -hmm. you, you know, but they they may not have had the detail. But again, I say that I think it came to me for a particular sharing, yeah. and to help to help show the patterns of how a cause and effect works from one life to an next. When when I when I put it all together and I looked at at, at successive lives, it became such a beautiful tapestry to me. Yeah. I thought, I thought, my God, this is beautiful the way the universe works. And you can see your suffering as prods to awaken, you know. It's just, there's no, there's no um, um, punishment to it. It's just, uh, it's just prods to help you awaken and to, sh and to show where you've maybe missed the step, missed the beat. And so, to me, it just, the universe becomes more, and the more you see, the more beautiful and intricate the universe becomes. Yeah. Well, you really did a good job of weaving it all together and, and showing the threads that went through the various lives and into your current life. And so, I, you could think of yourself as a kind of an emissary, you know. Not everyone has to have these memories or write such books, but, right. you know, you... Right. Like, not everybody has to be Mozart, but, you know, you, <laughs> you gave us a nice little taste there with, and, and it took the skills you have in this life to, you know, of speaking and writing and so on to, to do it in, a, in an effective way. I also, uh, th at the end of the book, um, 
talked more about my memories of actually dying in my last my last body and how in that in-between state, uh, which in fact feels more like home than than this world mm-hmm. because you go back you go back you know between between lines um, you 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 kind of um, bring closure to some of the things and you see what aspirations that haven't been fulfilled yeah. so I saw my last birth an aspiration to to come to America so I could study with my guru mm-hmm. Um, well, I did get born in America, and even though he was not in the body anymore, I was able to study his teachings from a very from a very early in my life and learn meditation, which was what I so much wanted to do. Um, so, so it's a time of 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 um, putting to rest uh, um, your experience of your just previous life and laying the blueprint for the future, and that's very important. This laying the blueprint for the future because. I think at the the last part, you know, if you say that, like the last quarter of your life, as you get to a certain point, you're already beginning to do that. Mm. Uh, you know, with um, you feel like a lot of the work, you know, you, you're bringing, you're kind of reaching, um, fulfilling your aspirations, things that you've set for yourself, and beginning to think about the next life. I know yeah. I find myself doing that a lot. Hmm. Um. I've read Michael Newton's books, you know, Life Between Lives. Have you read those? Um, I haven't read that, no. Uh, well, he was a hypnotist, a hypnotherapist of some kind, and he was at some point hypnotizing people to go into their past lives, and all of a sudden he discovered that people were going into the life... Between lives. The, yeah, the period between incarnations, and so he ended up specializing in that and, and wow. hypnotizing huh. literally thousands of people to go into that thing, and he, he kind of compared all of their accounts and uh, found tremendous consistencies between their accounts and really kind of mapped out what people apparently commonly experience in between lives. I think you'd enjoy reading those books. I will read them, yeah. But, yeah, but um, I was going to just say, I'm just at the stage of your book there where you're talking about between lives and I haven't finished it yet. It's the very last bit. Um, I wonder if we, we want to talk about that for a few minutes. I think people might find that interesting. Well, another um, one interesting point about that is is the, the the difference in time. So I was in this in between space. You know, it varies greatly. Somebody could could be there for a very brief time or for a very long time. It all depends on um, the conditions that that one needs to to come back into this into a body. But um, I was there for a short time. It was ten years, about ten years. Ten Earth years. Earth, in ten years, but. But you might say they say that that a year is like a day yeah. in in that in that place in that um, dimension. Mm-hmm. So it it as you can see, it felt like I had just arrived, and suddenly I'm hearing my guru call me again. <laughs> he, he he's calling me down again, and yeah. um, it, I didn't feel ready to to, to take a new birth. Mm-hmm. In a way, I hadn't processed everything, um, but but my main goal was to follow him. Yeah. <laughs> so I could not, I had to respond to that call. Yeah. yeah. I know you're a student of the Gita, and there's a verse in the Gita, as you know, where Arjuna asks Krishna, well, what happens if you, you know, die before you complete the, the, the journey? And basically he says, well, if, if you, you know, if you're a yogi, you might end up being, living in the celestial realms for a long, long time. And then, if you're, and then being born in a pure and, and illustrious family, and if you're lucky, in a family of yogis. But anyway, the indication is that um, in the, the celestial realms where you may reside, in between lives, what you just said, where you could be there for, uh, for in earth years, a long time, but up there it doesn't seem very long at all. There's a different perspective on time. So, I mean, that's where I think this idea of, of, um, of heaven Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I think I think some of the Abrahamic notions you can reconcile if you're if you're you know identifying with your personality and your and your body, um, then you can say okay that 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 goes away, and for a period of time you're living in maybe a heaven realm or maybe I mean there's so many <laughs> so many different dimensions, yeah. um, uh, and you may think that that's it, but of course. That's not it. There, right. You know, I mean, there's there's a lot more to go, and so you mm-hmm. you you continue on in the journey. Sure, and the Vedic tradition talks about hell realms too, but they don't yeah. say that any of those realms are permanent. You know, you you go exactly. there, you work off some karma, and then you come back. I mean, if you if you're you know um, 
a, a, a very greedy or angry person, you're going to be drawn into a realm where you can display those qualities, where those qualities, where there are others who have those qualities. Yeah. And since we're on this topic, um, let me grab my glasses here. There's a little section in the, your book that I just read this morning that I wanted to read and have you comment on. You say, um, the universe is teeming with life, not only the physical worlds, but the astral ones as well. And, even, and the even subtler causal worlds are inhabited by beings who no longer return to earth, having freed themselves from every earthly desire and karmic tie. There are planes of great darkness and planes of great beauty and light, where beings remain absorbed in the bliss of the one all-pervading consciousness, sending vibrations of love throughout the manifest worlds. It is this love that sustains universes. So I like that passage, and in, in light of the whole conversation about reincarnation, I think it's interesting to throw that in, too, um, that the, the whole notion of there being uh, various strata, subtle realms, you know, that in which beings reside. I mean, if it might sound like fanciful New Age Ooga Booga, but if, as we said in the beginning, if if the universe really works in a particular way, you know, um, it behooves us to understand it. Um, you know, gravity was doing just fine long before Sir Isaac Newton, and if, if this kind of thing that I just read from your book is actually a reality about how the universe functions, as spiritual seekers it might be good to align with that understanding or at least hold it as a, a viable hypothesis that we could contemplate and investigate. You know, um, most physicists today um, abide by the string theory, mm -hmm. which, which claims that their equations only work in a multidimensional universe, mm. no less than nine dimensions. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been following this a little bit because I, I've, I, I think that science is on the verge of some, some um, breakthroughs, you know, because science keeps, keeps discovering more and more about the universe. Yeah. Um, and I think the discovery, of, now they don't know what these dimensions are, they don't know how to access them, they, they don't know anything, right. except they even, I even heard a scientist say recently that it, Einstein's equations only work in a multidimensional universe. Mm. So could they be on the verge of discovering subtler and subtler realms? You know, and, and we know so little about the mind, you know, I mean, there's, there's always new stuff coming out, but we're just at the very beginning of understanding what consciousness is. I mean, n not even in the, in the kindergarten level right. of understanding in terms of scientific point of view. Now, the yogis and the rishis uh, and the great masters based, based their understanding, their realizations on personal experience. Mm -hmm. the, they had techniques, they had developed technologies, so to speak, spiritual technologies that enabled them to speed up evolution so they could you know, go very, very far in terms of developing their mental capacity and understanding. And so they're able to perceive things that, that we can't yet perceive. Um, and, and I think as one, as I said earlier, meditation, you're not just sitting in the darkness calming yourself. My, my problem with this whole meditation, um, the way it's being presented in the mindfulness movement, it's been dumbed it's being dumbed down to yeah. just like, uh, it's just about stress reduction. Yeah. It's just about relaxation. You know, yeah. that's not what it's about at all. True. You know, you can, you can go for a swim. You can go for a jog. There are lots of things you can do. <laughs> you, can, you can rock in a hammock yeah. to relax. Lots of things you can do to relax. Meditation is about awakening consciousness. And it's about understanding what consciousness and what life is, what this life is. Yeah. I have no problem if people want to use it to relax, but understand that that's not a, <laughs> that's not what happens. And 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 maybe I say, you know, maybe it's a step in the door for people. They start off wanting some stress reduction, and then before they know it, you know, they're, they're beginning to understand things in a new light. It is. It it does. I mean, I taught TM for many years, and uh, you know, in the intro lecture, we'd talk a lot about stress reduction and better health and stuff like that. But then once they've been meditating for four days, we'd be talking about cosmic consciousness. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, and, and then yeah. they'd say, whoa, yeah, I didn't think about that. This, that seems possible based on my experience of four days. Um, so it does, it, the, 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 the mundane practical stuff can be an entry point for some people. I think it has been, and, 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 it's, and I think it's, um, it's creating a wave in society that's going to bring a lot of benefit. 
because I think even if a certain percent of those people go in deeper, it's going to change their understanding of things. Uh, and that's what we need now. I mean, we need a wave, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. to carry us to the next to the next stage. Um, yeah. What you were saying about scientists discovering subtler things a minute ago was interesting. Um, I was just listening to an interview this morning with by Krista Tippett in interviewing, who does the On Being mm -hmm. program. On Being, yeah. Yeah, interviewing a physicist who had won the Nobel Prize for something. And um, he was talking about how Einstein had predicted gravity waves, but right, right. thought they could never be detected because they were way, way too subtle. But with current technology, they were, they were discovered a couple of years ago. And um, when you think about it, I mean, the kind of subtlety we're talking about here is not just in terms of physical phenomena, such as, well, gravity isn't actually physical, but it's not, a, not merely about the sort of material universe, it's about um, kind of, as, you, as, as your little quote from the book was saying, astral and causal or celestial realms, you know, stuff that scientists wouldn't dream of being able to explore. But as you said, the yogis have been exploring and the mystics have been exploring for, for thousands of years. So I always like to think of the human nervous system as a kind of scientific instrument, which if properly applied can aid science in understanding the full nature range of the universe. And, uh, and, and by properly applied, I would, I would mean applied in a scientific systematic way, you know, just um, not just hanging on beliefs, but proceeding experientially, step by step, as one goes deeper and deeper and refines the instrument. You know, I think one of the, uh, it's very positive that the, the, His Holiness the Dalai Lama and other um, um, Buddhist monks mm -hmm. are working with scientists to understand what happens in meditation, what are the, what are the changes in the, in the brain that take place. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've often wondered, you know, wh when I'm having these memories, are there any changes going on in my brain? I'm sure there are. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that that um, you know the brain is you can create new new grooves. I mean, the, the, one of the reasons why it's important for meditation to be regular mm -hmm. is that you create new grooves, new new patterns in the in the brain. Mm -hmm. So it's about evolution, really. I mean, I think I think we're at an evolutionary moment now, and um, you know, the more of us that the more people who can participate actively. In, this, in speeding up this evolution, the more we'll be able to, you know, the hundredth monkey, bring the rest of humanity along. Yeah. People might enjoy the interview I did some years ago with Rick Hansen, who talks a lot about neuroplasticity and how meditation changes the brain over time. And in terms of the, oh, were you going to say something? No, we're not. Uh, In terms of the hundredth monkey, I've, I've said this in other interviews, but there are quite a few examples in nature of how small percentages of a system can influence the whole system. Like in the heart, 1% of the cells are pacemaker cells. They synchronize the beating of the whole heart. Or, or in a laser, the square root of 1% of the photons, if they line up coherently, cause the other photons to entrain with them, and then the whole thing becomes one coherent beam, and you get a laser. So you know that per perhaps is applicable to human systems, in which a relatively small percentage awaken to a, a degree of spirituality or coherence and that kind of causes the, or allows the rest of society to entrain or to um, to, f yeah. to fall into line yeah. with that higher consciousness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I guess our challenge is to keep to keep our eye on the bigger picture and the bigger work and not get distracted by, by uh, the details which are very distracting. Yeah. Yeah, and, and like you said before, don't hide your head in the sand. I mean, there's no harm in watching yeah. the news and being aware of current events right. and all that stuff. Right, well, yeah. But, we you have know, to yeah, don't let it bum you out. You know? Yeah, Because yeah. <laughs> there's a brighter picture going on be, that's not quite getting reported on the evening news. Well, that's it. There is a brighter picture, and we have to keep reminding each other of that. The yeah. fact that, that there are so many conversations taking place like this, you know, and, and I have always felt... Um, uh, T ten years ago, we organized a, a gathering of spiritual teachers to look at the, the changing spiritual landscape of America. Mm -hmm. And that's when I saw the integration, um, you know, churches that are having um, sangha meetings, Buddhist practice after their mass and after their sermons, whatever. And I saw that there was such an, an integration among a growing population. Now, of course, it's not the majority, but it, it is a significant population now. Um, where it wasn't a significant population when we were starting out. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And so that's the positive story that we have to, and it's going to grow. It's going to grow. Yeah, it continues to grow. And yeah. I, don't, I don't see what could stop it, really. It's not like meditation is going to be outlawed or anything. We're not in the dark ages. We're not in the middle ages. We're not going to get burned at the stake for doing this. I mean, what's happening is is that meditation has moved out from its uh, first uh, um, group, you know, moved into all communities now. Yeah. You know, all communities. Yeah, which is which is wonderful because it's you know it's not just a middle class phenomenon. Right. Yeah, and there's inspiring examples. For instance, I interviewed a, a woman a couple months ago named Cavalier Morgan, who's become a good friend, and she's got this meditation program started in the Port- Portland Co- public school system, which is having profound effects and and huh. you know and transforming the lives of a lot of kids who potentially might have been suicidal or were getting bullied or, you know, or in various cliques and gangs and whatnot, but bringing them together in harmony. And it's really inspiring. There's a video of, of the whole thing on her website. <clears throat> um, I'll have to, have to check that out. Yeah. If you, Caverly Morgan, or, yeah, you can find What's her. What's her first name? Caverly, like C-A, 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 not cal- Cavalry, like calling the Cavalry, but C A V E R L Y. Cavalry. 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 Yeah. Anyway, a question came in from Mark Peters in Santa Clara, California. He said, Could you elaborate on your encounter with Yogananda more? Was the encounter in Germany in your previous incarnation? Yes. <laughs> you don't look like um, you would have been an, an adult in 1935. Well, I so. <laughs> know what I talk Actually, I have made that mistake of saying, Well, you know, in 1935, when I met. Um, yes, People think, well, I, you're well preserved. <laughs> I, I, as a refugee, was living in, in Europe, um, came in during the uh, Russian Revolution, was living there, I uh, was actually living in um, uh, Bucharest in Romania, and my brother was living in Germany, and I was going back and forth visiting him, um, and uh, I had taken an interest, I had come in contact with uh, the Bhagavad Gita, uh, through a library um, uh, in in Germany, and was an avid reader and looking, you know, looking for information, spiritual spiritual information, which was sparse at that time. Anything I could get my hands on, and this became known about me. And a, and a friend of my brother said, "There's a yogi uh, here, uh, on his way back from America to uh, to India. Uh, would you like to go hear him talk? It was at a private home somewhere, and so." I remembered with such interest, yes, and um, I walked into the room and was just uh, mesmerized. I had no exchange of words with him. He was speaking to a small group of people. Um, I didn't understand much English. His English was not was broken, not clear. So I don't even. I, it wasn't really? even a matter. Of Yogananda. Me. I thought he spoke uh, good English. He spoke good English, but if you, but, but. Um, toward the end of his life, even better. Yeah. But he had an accent. He had an accent. Strong Indian accent, yeah. Yeah, and tapes of his, um, they've had to um, use technology to, to improve the quality of the tapes because mm-hmm. he did have an accent. Okay. I mean, he, he knew how to, I mean, his English, he could have conversation, but it was with an accent. Yeah. If somebody who didn't know uh, English very well, it would be difficult. So, um, but it was the vibration that affected me. And... I felt that a moment happened where he glanced at me and something happened in that glance. And so I, um, I, after he finished talking, there were people around him. I didn't have a chance. I was very, very shy. Uh, I had no public role. I was a very private person. So I didn't even go up and greet him. I just qu- quietly left. But um, it had a great impact on me. Uh, my mother had given me, before I left Russia, a locket with the Virgin Mary in it, and I took that picture out and wrote down his name and put that in the locket. Um, And things went downhill after that. Um, A a man I was in love with, a Jewish professor, was captured and taken by the Nazis, disappeared, and the the Jews were being round up, and um, I was briefly held by the Nazis and and then let go. And just took a train and went to Vienna, and there I got sick. And, and while I was um, in a fever, I had a dream where Yogananda said, I'm coming to take you to America. 
because my aspiration was, oh, I want to follow this man. I don't understand what he's said, but I've never been in the presence of someone with such powerful vibration, powerful energy. And so I had that dream, um, and I, th- I waited. I thought, he's coming to take me to America. Uh, and, of course, he didn't show up. <laughs> and I kept thinking, well, any day now, he's going to show up. And then I, I got sick and died soon after that. And on my deathbed, I saw him and he said, I'm coming to take you to, I've come to take you to America. Mm. And I died and was reborn in America. Um, and that was my experience. And then, you know, I found Yogananda in this life when I was 19 or 20 and somebody, in co- was in college, somebody handed me autobiography of a yogi. All I had to do was see the picture. And I knew that was my guru. Mm. And so I, I knew that I had met Yogananda even earlier in my history, before that, this, this pre- past birth. And in the book, I talk about an earlier encounter with him in one of his earlier births. Um, and I know that it's a long, a long relationship with him. But that... Which um, one was that? I forgot. about William well, the Conqueror. Oh, maybe I didn't get to that yet. Is it in the very end? It's at the end of the oh, book, okay. yeah. Okay, I'll have to get, I'll read that tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, Yogananda it's, was William the Conqueror, are you saying? That, that's, that's, what it's, that's, what the, that's what the word is. Wow, <laughs> it okay. Was, um, but but um, I talk about a different, a different, you know, he's known in history in a certain way, mm-hmm. and there were other aspects of him where he was spiritually imbuing the land uh, and, and putting in the energy or, that enabled Great Britain to become what it became. Hmm. Interesting. So William the Conqueror was a British king, was he? He was French, actually, oh, okay. and he, he actually went doing, there was a time when the um, Vikings were, there were a lot of raids from the mm-hmm. Vikings, and he, um, he came and conquered England, basically, I and see. brought brought Christianity mm-hmm. to, to, uh, to, to England. Huh. I mean, the beautiful thing is, I remember, I remember being all different religions and different, different races, and, and, and that changes your feeling about those religions and races when you remember being them. Yeah. You don't recount any lifetimes in which you were a man. No, but I do have a memory of being a man, but I just don't have a full narrative. There are a, f- the few things, I mean, there are things that I've left out in the book where I just have an image mm-hmm. and not a full narrative. And so I, I, I couldn't... Um, yeah, there was one in particular of being a Native American, but it was a very brief life, and I just had a scene that I re- that I remembered from it. Yeah. So I'm even now, um, as you go through your days, are you constantly presented with memories and like well, little it's, movies it's, popping up in your mind of past lives? I I, I I am, especially since I'm I'm deep in this in this um, this uh, this other book, mm-hmm. which is uh, um, during the time of Ram and Sita. And so I'm almost finished that. But, um, but, but even, you know, I still process things that are in the book, you know, trying to, those memories, you know, still emerge every now and then, things that I've written about. Uh, and, and I relate it to something that's happening in my current life or people. I mean, the thing, one of the great lessons for me, I would say I would narrow it down to three, changing the relationship I look at death and knowing myself to have a long history and a long future and just, you know, the shaper of that. Mm. Um, um, it, it, changing my sense of identity so that, that my attachment to this body and this personality is much weaker. And the third thing is the power of love. You know, the universe operates the, for the, at the foundation is this, is this love. I mean, I don't really separate consciousness from love. I think one of the qualities of consciousness is love. Uh, and so pure, pure, unadulterated consciousness is this blissful conscious being, mm. uh, beingness, which we are a part of. Um, but but um, the, the beings in the past, my guides and teachers, Yogananda being one of them, um, but my Sufi father, that Baba, I feel that I'm still connected with them. I feel their love crossing boundaries of time and geography um, another thing that's time time is a, is a creation of the mind and so is space so while we can I can be in different time periods simultaneously I'm also in different spatial uh, zones 
And so I often find myself in that in-between t- place where I have this mentor, spirit guide there, mm-hmm. who, who often guides me in this life. So it's not the way it seems. We, our mind packages our, our, our life into a, a linear time and a very limited spatial uh, uh, zone, and then it all seems very confined and rational. It's not like that. Yeah. Yeah, I've had people tell me that in, in their insight, time isn't linear, and that actually all the past lives that we have have not been sequential, they're simultaneous, and that we somehow serve as a filter to give a a sequential structure to the universe, but it really doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. That's my experience, but I don't quite understand it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not, I think our, our, our minds, you know, when people argue about this word God, I say to them, I say to them, how can human language or human mind possibly grasp what is the way it is? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that brings up another interesting point, which is that you talk about how complex karma is, both individual and collective. And, you know, when you think about it, if every little thing that we do has, you know, repercussions and ramifications throughout the universe and, 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 all, and it all somehow gets calculated and come back, comes back to us, imagine the computing power that would be required to keep track of all that. Phenomenal. I yeah. mean, it's just beyond, beyond, beyond. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, some people might say, well, it couldn't possibly be because there couldn't be that much computing power. But think about a single cell in your finger and how complex it is. It's just as complex as a modern city, and it, it also repairs and replicates itself. So if, uh, and it, so if that can be orchestrated and managed by some intelligence, and we have, you know, 60 trillion of them in our bodies, then why not, you know, the whole universe being governed or or... or conducted through a law such as karma. The universe is not chaotic. Right. It's based on law. Mm-hmm. And, and um, f- you know, there, there are laws that keep everything, you know, laws of gravitation that keep uh, things from crashing into each other. I mean, it, 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 it works. Yeah. And, and same thing as these spiritual laws. And um, the sooner we understand them, the better off we'll be. Even chaos is governed by law. I, I gave a talk yeah. at the Sand Conference a few years ago, and I took that clip from Star Wars where Han Solo took the Millennium Falcon into the asteroid field in order to evade the, you know, the, the Darth Vader's yeah, yeah. guys that yeah, were chasing. Yeah, yeah. And I said, you know, all those asteroids that seem to be randomly shot, that's all perfect, you know, it, it abides well, perfectly perfect. by laws of nature uh, and laws of gravity in that case. And then, you know, one of the people chasing him smacked into an asteroid and I said all right that little bit there was in perfect accordance with the karma of the guy who was driving that ship I mean it's all just completely perfect right. like clockwork you know it's like clockwork yeah. it really is <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, it just it, it um, you know gives one a sense of just awe it and uh, but but one has but when you tap into the love you know the fact that 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 love is a very uh, real part of the whole thing, uh, and we experience that. I mean, I think the microcosm reflects the macrocosm, mm-hmm. and we experience it. And the you know we experience it, and and I think that's what the human community desperately. That's probably the greatest calling right now is to awaken more of that love. Mm. You know, um, because we've gotten away from it. You know, we've become. Um, it, you know, of, of course, it's it's not. You know, there's still a lot of love in the world. <laughs> But how do we bring it back into the public space? Yeah, I think it's you know it's kind of happening. We were talking earlier about you know the things things seem kind of dark, but at the same time there's some rays of yeah. light that are shining. I mean there's yeah. so many yeah. things you know Black Lives Matter and and Me Too movement and you know people just not tolerating police brutality anymore and all kinds of. Things are coming to light, especially with social media and everybody carrying a camera. Well, that's true. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, you look at the the migrant kids and how many people have been moved by that those stories. So, yeah. I mean, I mean, you look at the boys in 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 Thailand. The whole world was watching, you know. And and so I think that the, that that I mean, 
you know, we saw the positive impact of, of, of the Internet. Now, um, now we're seeing the dark side of the Internet. It has a dark side. Uh-huh. And um, all the techn- same thing with the atom bomb. I mean, there was a positive side to that, too. And, and then we saw the dark side of it. So, you know, how do we, how, we, there are so many technologies waiting in the future that will, that will, you know, benefit, bring a benefit. But they may not come to us until we learn, learn how to reject the dark side of these technologies or, or, or manage them better. Well, there are technologies even now which could make a huge difference, you know, in terms of, uh, I mean, Alternative energies, for instance. Exactly. You know? and also, yes, that's the big one. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah. it could be applied much more quickly than they are being applied. But there's people who, as you were saying earlier, are looking at the next quarter profits and, and trying to repress them because yeah. Yeah. regardless of what happens to the world 50 years from now because of the short-sightedness. So it's just a sort of a matter of broadening perspective, I guess, and you know, have, seeing the big picture, being moved by compassion instead of greed, things like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and realizing, I mean, we've been, we have a lot of focus on, on building human unity. That's what the interfaith movement has done. Mm-hmm. But we've got to grow that toward, toward unity with all of life, with the planet, with our, you know, forests and with our rivers and just... The oceans, everything. The oceans, everything. Seeing them as part of us, not separate from us. Yeah. Which, of course, is a very spiritual perspective, uh, perspective not, not an esoteric one. It's like, if we're really all one, then we're one with the... the you know, the ocean, and why are we putting, you know, Texas-sized patches of plastic into it, and you know, choking all the fish and bleaching all the coral, and you know, all that stuff? We're doing it to ourselves. Well, I think that's one of the shifts in consciousness. I mean, I think that there are a few shifts in consciousness that could really help us forward, and, and one of them is this this understanding that that. Um, we are the oceans. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? and the rainforest. And the, and the rainforest. And the, everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're part of our body, and we need, we're part of them, and uh, we need to treat them like part of our body. Ask not for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, a question came in from Bill from Cork, Ireland. Um, all right, I always get in trouble when I bring up Trump questions, but here we go. Hi, Dina. Right now, President Trump is visiting the UK. He has already secretly criticized, not see, oh, severely criticized his host, Theresa May. Do you think that in reality, Trump and Brexit's gross egotism is in reality giving us all a big wake-up call to the fact that our own individuality is actually equally important to the whole? In other words, it's Dina and the whole, Rick and the whole, Bill and the whole, my dog Charlie and the whole. I think we have forgotten that our own individuality is of equal importance. What do you think? Well, I hadn't thought of it that way. Um, well, I know a lot of us are reflecting deeply on what the message is. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> what, what, what's the wake-up call? We know it's a wake-up call. Um, and I have thought of it as, as, as both karmically a, a return for things that we've done, and uh, bringing up the darkness that people that have been uh, that's been hiding out in, in people's uh, subconscious, um, but but um, could be a wake up call that we are part of the whole. Um, it could be, yeah. yeah. I guess the way I interpret his question is that everyone matters, you know, no matter how apparently insignificant or small. Uh, I mean, I've heard people say, well, you know, we have to sacrifice the individual for this great cause. And, you know, maybe that's a heroic sentiment if you're a soldier or something. But, um, you know, but everybody has intrinsic value. And, you know, we can't treat people like objects or like garbage or as disposable and so on. And our, our as you were saying earlier, our, our economic systems tend to do that. They're structured that way you know, tiny fraction of the world's population having tremendous wealth and a huge percentage struggling. So, you know, if, if we're all... I, oh, go ahead. Every, every, I think everyone is equally important, and that's one of the, the uh, imbalances in our society, as you just said, mm-hmm. is giving importance just to a handful of people, and that's going to that's gonna reverberate. I mean, that's going to bring a karmic return that's ugly. Um, and, and until we get the message that everyone is equally important and, and we have to care for everybody, um, then, then um, 
uh, and that you can't pe- treat people like they're you know call people names as if they're 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 not conscious beings. Yeah. Uh, and and it you know it's being shoved in our face this attitude you know that there are people who are important to the, and everybody else is not important it's being shoved in our face, mm. and and um, and we have to reject it you know and we have to state in a positive way. So how do you turn that negative energy into a positive? Yeah. Sometimes when topics mm-hmm. like this come up in interviews, I get feedback from people saying. You know, stop talking about this political stuff and this social stuff. Talk, stick to spirituality. This is spirituality. I mean, it is spirituality. Spirituality is, <laughs> is all inclusive. It, 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 it's all it's inclusive. The, the whole enchilada. You know, it's not just some pie in the sky, esoteric. You know, hide in an ashram kind but, of thing. It, it, yeah. it has tremendous relevance to all the issues that confront us. And, and, and things are being done in our name. Yeah. Things are being done in our name, and I know. I, I think. Um, I, some people respond with anger, and some people respond with pain. My experience has been just pain, uh. pain at at the pain that's being caused. You know, um, the children, the toddlers who are being separated from their parents. I mean, that's causing pain to Americans. I mean, a lot of us are suffering as a result of that. Yeah. And, and and that suffering needs to be acknowledged. You know, things that are being done in our name are causing suffering to the American people. <laughs> yeah. And that's a very real thing that needs to be acknowledged. I mean. We can't, you know, the problem with, we had the experience not so long ago of World War II when people did not speak up. People mm-hmm. didn't speak up. The church didn't speak up. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, there are people still alive who remember that period, and then people who remember it from their past birth. That's still in our collective memory. What is the lesson we're supposed to learn from that? That we have to speak up, and we, but we have to speak up not with anger, but with a sense of this is not Right. This is not dharmic. I mean, you know, I, I in order to create a society that's based on on proper values, we have to bring to public mind what those values are. You know, it's not name calling. It's not lying. It's not cheating. It's not you know abusing public funds. You know, it's 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 uh, we have to speak up in this. Otherwise, we're going to um, we're we're creating a society that, a society that's built on um, false values. Yeah, and a related point, and I don't know how much attuned to this whole thing you are, is that I've been involved with a group of people who are attempting to sort of draft a code of ethics for spiritual teachers because there's a lot of Great. unethical things that have been done in the name <laughs> of spirituality, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. And I've just written a whole essay about it, I'll share it with you if you like. But I would like, yes. Yeah, um, but it's one of those things that, it, as time has come, as as with the the Me Too movement, and you know, so many people have been puzzled or have been kind of like accepting severe abuse and alcoholism and and sexual misconduct from spiritual teachers as something that they just can't understand, you know, because he's enlightened and I'm ignorant and he's inscrutable and I, it must be a crazy wisdom teaching or something. Forget it. It's that the time for that kind of behavior has it's ended. Over. Is over. I would say I wouldn't even call them spiritual teachers. I would say so-called spiritual teachers. Yeah, yeah. Because you, you, when you're causing harm to somebody, um, that's that's not you. You're not a spiritual teacher. People who have claimed to be at a state that they're clearly not, and students. I mean, how are students to judge this? You know, students. You know. They may be able to have a certain spiritual uh, uh, attainment, but but certainly not at the level where they where they uh, behave in a way that brings benefit instead of causing harm to people. And you know, to me, that's the barometer. You know, if if you're not being truthful, if you're not being honest, if you're causing harm to people, then then and and this is more of a well, I guess it's always existed, but but there've been a. a um, it's been a phenomenon that's been going on for what, 40, 50 years now. Yeah. And I think it's caused a lot of the the great spiritual leaders to go into retreat. You can hardly find them anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're not in the marketplace. <laughs> yeah. Here's a paragraph I just wrote this morning. I'll I'll run it by you. It said, "I think that prospective students are entitled and even obligated to evaluate teachers. One question to ask is, do I want to become like this person?" 
if he's an alcoholic, a sexual predator, etc., are those qualities I wish to embody? One might argue that one can learn a lot from a person without mirroring his personality. That may be true of a mathematics professor, but is less so of a spiritual teacher. The spiritual aspirant entrains with the personality and consciousness of the teacher. The scenes around some of these bad boy teachers, drinking and sexual promiscuity and so on, spirituality is all about attaining inner clarity. Our behavior reflects our inner state. What inner state does debauchery reflect? Think about it. That's, it's, I'm so glad you're doing this because it's, it's uh, much, much needed now. It's been needed for a long, a long time. Too many, too many students have gotten hurt. And then what does it do? It, 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 it casts a cloud on the whole spiritual movement. Yeah. You know, uh, it's been too easy now for people to write off teachers from the East and saying, you know, they're just, look what they do. And, and so not to even have a sense of responsibility for what you're, the tradition you're representing. I mean, there is that responsibility there. Yeah. You know, when you put yourself as, uh, out as a teacher, if you've got human floors, fine, go work out your issues, <laughs> but don't represent a tradition. <laughs> yeah. And of course, some venerable traditions have fairly strict guidelines as to who is qualified to be a teacher, you know, right. and people yeah. like Buddha and Shankara and Ramana and so on, they didn't just send anybody out willy-nilly to teach. They, they made right. sure that they were really qualified. And I've seen too many people, because you and I both work in this world, who want to be teachers. And as soon as the, there's the desire there to want to be a teacher, that already says something. Yeah, it should almost disqualify them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I'm sort of joking, because some people are legitimately qualified, and, and that's, their, that's their dharma, and they should do it. Yeah, but, and, and there are all levels of teachers. I mean, you know, there, there are people, certainly you can receive help from people at, at all different stages mm -hmm. on their spiritual path. Yeah. All right, enough on that point. Um, if you have time, there is one other thing that you've devoted a fair amount of time to, and uh, I thought it might be interesting to discuss it a little bit. You've, you've convened meetings of Buddhist and Hindu um, monks and, and, and uh, you know, yogis and so on to um, contrast their understandings and experience of the self whether there's no self or all self or or whatever um, how did that go and uh, you know what are some what are some reflections on that that debate well it's interesting because the yogis would come to the point of saying we we agree with you there's no difference and the buddhists would ins would insist no there is a difference mm -hmm. and this, this is or the b buddhists a little bit more stubborn or something or i think so i think they want to distinguish themselves from the hindus huh. <laughs> But, but uh, in actuality, the place that we came to was that it's all a matter of language. What do you mean by self? Yeah. It's all language, you know. I mean, you know, I, I see the vision, the yogic vision is no different from the Buddhist vision that I've heard, but it's described in different terms mm. and different ways of getting there. Um, but, 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 but the end result, I've, I've seen no difference. And, and most of my... Swami friends, yoga friends, uh, agree with that, but there, but uh, it's harder for me to get the Buddhists to see that. Hmm. Uh, and I and I think that there is there's a, a kind of a built-in attachment coming from the Buddhist time, um, that 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 this is a new that that they're just you know that the, the Hindus don't quite get um, the 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 end the end result that as long as there is the concept of the self, so it comes down to what is the self. Mm. The, the self is no different from, you know, I, I have a very dear friend, Tenzin Pamo. I don't know if you, you know her. She's a um, Buddhist nun, uh, uh, lives, lives, has a nunnery in Damsala. And I had this conversation with her once. And she's one of the few who said, of course, there's no difference. She said, uh, a primordial, of course, there's a primor primordial consciousness. And so I, I said to myself, well, that's the answer. You know, I don't use the term God. Um, but I use the, you know, I use more Vedic terms. Mm -hmm. uh, but but it's it's about this primordial consciousness. I mean, what what is the self? But uh, uh, um, that primordial consciousness appearing to divide itself mm -hmm. into into the many. Yeah. You know, that's what it means. It's there's only one, but there's the appearance of the many. We're not separate from that in the ultimate sense. Yeah, this is a good point. I mean, so many there have been so many fights and actual literal wars 
over these subtle distinctions. I mean, whether God is formless or, or, or form, form yeah. you know? I mean, you went through a couple different lifetimes where you had to experience from both, both directions, both perspectives. And, and both uh, are true. <laughs> yeah, and they're, they're both true. It's, it's they're like, both true. Yeah. <laughs> Surtz is a candy mint. Surtz is a breath mint. Both. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody gets to be right. <laughs> yeah. uh, all righty. Well, do you feel like there's anything? Um, I mean, there's a lot of th things I could keep bringing up. There are all kinds of cool things in your book. There, there are various. There are certain themes that you kind of carried from one life to the next, like a, like a, one of those races in the Olympics where they hand the baton off to the next runner, and then that person keeps running. You know, there, there are certain things that happened in your Russian life that then moved into your next life, and so on. And, and yeah. there's a logical kind of sequence to it. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about well, specific examples of that or if you feel like wrapping it up. I'm, I'm good either way. Well, there, there are two, two themes that, that it, was, it was interesting for me to, to become aware of. One was the theme of, of um, finding my own voice as a woman and confidence as a woman and, there, and, and looking to find spiritual, full spiritual flowering in a woman, which I found eventually in Africa, uh, and through my shaman, woman, shaman teacher was a woman. But that was a theme. And so when I found myself, you know, I, I was not particularly involved in the feminist movement as a young girl, uh, because I was mostly on my, you know, see, seeking to develop my spiritual practice. So I wasn't, I was active in the civil rights movement, in the anti-war movement, and then 18, 19, I got involved in my spiritual search, and withdrew a little bit, and really spent a lot of time uh, in studying the texts. Um, so, so I didn't, I wasn't so active as, as a feminist, but then when I found myself working with women spiritual teachers, I would often say, how did I get into this? You know, yeah, I, I do want to help, I do want to provide a platform, but how did I get into this? Um, and, and also, I was not interested in religion, I was interested in my own spiritual practice. So how did I get into working in the interfaith? I got to work with, with, with rabbis now again, you know, I was, I was born Jewish, turned away from that. And, so I wondered about these two things, working with women spiritual teachers and working in interfaith. And when I look back, I saw that th these two themes came up again and again. Well, I was in a situation where I had to bridge cultures. One was in India when I was married as a Hindu to a, to a, a Muslim uh, a, a king uh, or sheikh. And I, I had to be some kind of a bridge. And then again in Japan, between warring clans, I had to be some kind of a bridge. So these themes of finding my voice as a woman and finding my spiritual potential as a woman, on the one hand, and then trying to bridge cultures and find a meeting place, on the other hand, these two themes really came to completion in this life as Dina. And so maybe that work is done. Hmm. Do you ever have a feeling like that there might be something in your current life that you are nowhere near r really resolving or working out and that that might be the theme of your next life? Yes, what, deep meditation. Would, I've, a I've deeper had meditation? Deeper meditation. I've, I've always had the desire for a more reclusive life mm -hmm. and I've, I've, I've been, um, you know, found myself or thrust into, however you want to say it, into a life of a lot of activity. Mm. You know, a lot of, I'm a social activist, I'm engaged in climate issues and environmental issues and in mentoring young people, a lot of issues. And I said to myself, oh, can I have a you break? know, if only can I be, no, okay. ashram, where's my ashram? I want yeah. my ashram. <laughs> and I think I'll find my ashram. I'll get to the ashram in the next time, next time around. <laughs> cool. Uh, well, another question came in. This is from um, Goryana from Belgrade, Serbia. She asks, I presume that's a woman's name, Based on your meditation experience in terms of accessing past lives and finding a guru, is there, any, is there a validity of accessing past lives and a guru through a dreaming state? I guess she's wondering, can we have these yes. experiences in dreams? Yes, absolutely. As a matter of fact, the way my awakening happened was through dreams. I, I moved into a house when I was 30, and for the next 10 years, I began dreaming of another house. And it was always the same place. And I'd wake up with a sense of longing. Oh, I've been there again. And a sense of sadness. Mm -hmm. And uh, as my memories awakened, I realized this was a house that I had lived in as a child in Russia. Um, and, and so d dreams, um, things come to me in dreams very often, actually. Mm. Uh, dreams are a portal. And um, I can't 
you know, can't control when it's going to happen, but you, I would say, yes, you definitely can access uh, your past and higher states in, in, in dreams. You're more open. You're more open, yeah. yeah. Irene just scribbled down a note here that you, and I'm sure you're familiar with this notion that um, it's said in the Vedic tradition that your the last thought at the time of death determines your next life and that your last thought is determined by your deepest impression. Then that sort of sets the agenda for the next time around. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You deep. So it's useful to think. It's useful to you know. In, in addition to one's meditation uh, practices, I, I think a time of reflection, of of um, looking at what those deepest impressions and what your deepest aspirations um, are is very useful. Because you know, to be conscious that we are shaping our future. You know. Yeah. And I know that in contemporary India sometimes the thinking has been well you know spirituality is for old people you should do your be a student and get you know do your business your marriage and your your business career and raise your kids and then when you get old you can get into that latest stage last stage of life and think about spirituality but it's really a lifelong undertaking and is not only not incompatible with all these other stages of life but is actually conducive to their success well, as you said, everything you can't separate it. Right. Um, your work is your your sadhana. Your work is your spiritual practice, and work should be looked upon that way as as part of your spiritual practice. Uh, I mean, everything we do is part of our spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. And to separate your spiritual practice as just the time that I'm in the cushion, well, that's a very short part of the day, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. We don't want to limit it to that. We want everything the way we deal with our children, the way we deal with our spouse. Um, it's all got to be part of our spiritual awareness, our practice. <laughs> Irene just, just, oh, just uh, oh, maybe that's just, oh, now I got to say it because I already started saying it. She just said, you know, ba based upon this thing of deepest impression in, in her next incarnation, she's either going to be a dog or a TV. <laughs> no, <so> <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. A dog's life with a good owner is not bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we've had some ones that are, <laughs> that are very uh, lucky, lucky dogs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All righty, well, this has been really fun, Dina. I've really... It's I, been great. I enjoyed it, too, very yeah. much. Yeah, thank you so much for a very f interesting week reading your book. I've you know, <laughs> really gotten into it. Joining me on my journey, huh? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I look forward to reading the next one. Okay, yeah, next one's going to be interesting. Yeah. All right, Rick. Well, it's great to talk to you, and I hope we connect again. Yeah, now don't just disconnect. I want to make a couple oh. of concluding remarks. Um, okay. So I've been speaking with Dina Merriam, and um, this is part of an ongoing series of interviews. So um, if you'd like to be notified of future ones, please go to batgap.com, and there's a place to sign up for the email notification. You can also subscribe on YouTube, and um, then I guess YouTube notifies you when there's a new one. And if you, if you go to batgap.com, explore the menus, because there's several things there you might find interesting. Um, so thanks for listening or watching, and thanks again, Dina, and we'll see you all next week.